Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on your Tuesday evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce to you all our latest webinar, Long COVID in Athletic Populations. And of course, we're bringing this to you in partnership with the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy and the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. Uh, we've got some fantastic speakers this evening, including an athlete perspective. I'm just going to get us underway with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, and let you know how we're going to run the session, and then I'll hand you over to our speakers for the evening. So tomorrow, after the talk, just to preempt some questions, you will receive a link to the recording of tonight's session if you want to check back on any of the slides or information. And if you requested a certificate, we'll also send you that. They'll come in an email uh, probably tomorrow evening. So please bear with us on getting that information out. Uh, tonight's session will be approximately 60 minutes. We may run a little bit over depending on how the Q&A goes. With regards to the Q&A, you can see the box I've circled there. We would like you to post your questions in there, please, rather than in the chat. It allows us to organise them. And if you could have a look at what's already been posted um, and upvote a popular question or the question that you were thinking of asking, because we'll be taking the questions in um, popularity order. After the session, you will also get directed to a really quick survey We'd appreciate it if you could take two minutes of your time to complete that, give us your feedback um, on the session, and that will help us to improve how we run these events for the future. And we'll allow you to suggest some topics as well, which we'd really appreciate. Just in case there's any of you joining us on the YouTube live stream rather than in Zoom this evening, just want to let you know that I will be monitoring uh, the questions and comments that come in via YouTube as well. So if you're on, over on that platform and you do have questions, please do still submit them. And our first speaker for the evening uh, which is Helen Hart from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. Helen's just going to talk us through the uh, long COVID rehabilitation standards uh, and then we'll move on from there. Great, thank you so much, Ollie. Let me just get my screen up for us. And I just want to give you just a really brief overview before we get on to the good stuff tonight about the CSP's COVID rehabilitation standards. And really, uh, CSP has been working um, since the pandemic started, and we created our first set of standards really quite quickly um, as we sort of um, saw the pandemic developing. And I'm really proud to say that we're now on version two of the standards, both for those who have been hospitalised with acute COVID infection and for those that haven't been. And, and as you can see on the screen there, this picture is about the COVID rehabilitation standards for community rehab service delivery. And what's really good about these standards is that we've pulled these together in the second iteration with huge support from our membership who've been working in COVID and long COVID services. And in addition to that, um, something that I'm really proud of is that we've got a very, very strong lived experience flavor through this. So we've been working closely with our colleagues at Long COVID Physio to make sure that really the patient experience, that lived experience, that, that true to life experience really shines through the standards. I mean, we can see here, there are seven standards in total and really they're about supporting members um, to navigate their way through COVID and long COVID in terms of rehabilitation and what good rehabilitation really looks like. And so there's nothing in here that will be of great, great surprise to anybody. We know that good rehab is needs led, uh, that it's well planned, that it's personalized, that we empower people in their recovery through supporting their self-management and coordinating really where that is important to do so. So I think what I want to say is that although these standards have been developed for, with physiotherapy in mind, there's nothing here that is unique to the profession. And we really want to encourage um, practitioners from across the spectrum to really engage with these standards. And the QR code there on, on the screen will take you directly to our website where you can get access to them because they're just a really solid way based firmly in evidence and experience about what good rehab looks like for people who are living with COVID and long COVID. So that's the seven main themes of the standards themselves and where we have um, updated them in this second iteration really is to think about that clinical risk stratification and I think what's really critically important at the moment is that idea 
of safety, safety and assessment of understanding your personal scope of practice and working within that scope of practice to provide the best available care. And I think also what we're talking about here is that impact of inequalities and the disparity in outcomes. And I'm really excited to listen to the presentations here tonight. It's gonna to be a real learning point for me, I think, because as we know, long COVID is really no respecter of age or physical fitness. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting, I think, tonight to listen to, to a really athletic um, position on this and really take from, from tonight's presentation a lot of new information that I think will be applicable across the spectrum because let's be honest, there is, there's space within this space, this new space for working in now for us all to play a really important role in recovery from this pandemic. So I'm not gonna hold you up any longer. I'm gonna uh, hand you straight on to James who's gonna take you through the next part of the presentation. But thanks again for having us. I hope you enjoy tonight. So, thank you very much indeed, Helen. I'm just gonna share my slides. And then I'll be with you, so. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Okay, so look, uh, it's, it's my absolute pleasure to be with you this evening and um, to join you for this uh, special webinar talking about long COVID in athletic populations. Um, and over the course of the next 60 minutes, um, we've put together a program which I hope will um, answer a number of the questions that you've logically have about COVID in the young and athletic individuals, right from the range from professional and elite athletes down to the recreational athlete who's trying to get back into sport following COVID infection. So the plan for this evening is I'm going to kick off and I'm just going to set the scene a little bit and just talk a bit about what we know about COVID in the athletic population. And then I'm going to hand over to Julie Moore, who's our lead respiratory physiotherapist at the Institute for Sport, Exercise and Health. And many of you will know Julie already, uh, but has done a lot of work, particularly in both patients recovering from hospital-based uh, COVID infection, but also, of course, within our service, looking at athletes and how we can get athletes back. And we've also really got, um, uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Guy Learmonth, who is a Team GB 800 meter runner and has competed in many international events, including the Commonwealth Games, who is going to talk about the lived experience of struggling with COVID and talk about some of the symptoms and issues he faced and the challenges he faced with COVID, which I think will nicely enable us to talk about some of the issues as we face them as clinicians and how we can take on the challenges of helping athletes improve. So let me open up a little bit to start with and just set the scene from what we know about COVID and the kind of illness that we've all been facing over the uh, course of the last 18 months. I think it's probably helpful in some way just to present my background because, of course, uh, I'm not uh, entirely positioned within the sports medicine world. I'm a respiratory physician. I work at the Royal Brompton Hospital, but I have a great interest in sport and trying to help athletic individuals and so I work with the English Institute of Sport with a number of different anti-doping bodies and I'm involved in a task force for the International Olympic Committee to try and help optimize and improve respiratory health of athletes uh, particularly of course those at the Olympic level. So what do we know about COVID? Well um, uh, there's this sort of rumor or story that it's all over in the UK and the numbers are falling rapidly and we're, we're facing a time of great joy as we've uh, reached Freedom Day and we're going to move away from this um, very quickly. The reality, of course, on a global level is that many countries are still seeing rising case numbers, particularly, I think, in the States now and indeed in the UK within the last week. Um, where we did see some initial very encouraging falls, the data seems to have plateaued somewhat, and we may just simply be seeing uh, the influence of a fall at the end of the school year. And so we're still very focused on it as respiratory clinicians and as a very important and, of course, relevant immediate um, global health worry. Perhaps more encouraging is the data that's sent, tending to suggest now that the vaccines are helpful in terms of preventing very severe cases, hospitalizations and deaths. And certainly um, the modeling seems to suggest that if we get the vaccination strategy right in a given country, um, we may start to see a situation where the condition starts to become what might be termed low endemic. And so there are, is a case background level, but there isn't the huge numbers that we saw um, last year and certainly earlier this year. 
This is what it looks like when it attacks the lung. So you can see on a chest X-ray that actually in the initial stages, it might look quite benign where you see these lung fields which don't have much in the way of infiltrate within them. But if you look at this CT scan, so here you see someone lying on their back and having these multiple slice scans through the lung to allow us to look at the lung tissue. What you see is these very horrible looking patchy white ground glass infiltrates described as ground glass because that's what they literally look like. And this is the type of condition which, frankly, you see even in mild athletic individuals um, who are struggling with breathlessness or a cough at home. And when I bring them in and sometimes CT scan them, I find this degree of widespread abnormality. And so you can understand why people feel pretty grotty even climbing a flight of stairs. The other thing, of course, that we've learned about this condition is it affects other structures. And within the CT here, you see the heart um, that can become inflamed. And of course, even within the other structures in the chest cavity, the pulmonary blood vessels here, you see this horrible looking blood clot as the blood becomes much more sticky as, it's, as, as the body's trying to fight this uh, immune condition. Now, of course, much of the emphasis on giving COVID care or focusing on COVID care has been in the population above the age of 50, where we see the highest rates of hospitalization, severe disease, use of intensive care, and very sadly, the mortality signal, which you can see here. But if you look overall and look at the burden of illness, it's actually the younger populations which contribute a huge amount to the overall number of cases. Yes, they may be more mild. Yes, they associated with fewer uh, hospital admissions, but they um, as a proportion, contribute a huge burden to the overall number of cases is infected. And that has implications, of course, consequences for the type of cases you may see um, if you're thinking about long COVID and particularly in the young athletic population, which we want to focus on this evening. The COVID-19 Zoe tracker app um, has proven very useful in terms of uh, providing us with a source of information. Some of you will have dialed uh, in from, um, uh, from countries outside um, the UK, but within the UK, we've had this tracking app, which um, many millions of people have contributed to on a daily basis, which allows you to track the type of symptoms you get and then provide some intelligence regarding the numbers of COVID, but also the behavior of the clinical condition. And so here's some data looking at individuals tracking the duration of their symptoms. And what you see from this is that, okay, there is some limitations in the way the data might be collected and the way people report this. But on average, the symptoms and the duration of symptoms is roughly about 10 to 11 days. And then there's this longer tail of individuals who get more, much more persistent symptoms pushing right out from a month onwards. We're going to talk a lot about that today. What, are, what is the sort of impact of this sort of longer COVID or this more protracted COVID symptoms? Well, if we take the um, Zoe um, tracker app and we look at the data as it's reported, and here's a very nice letter that went to Nature Medicine. Within that data set reported from data last year, you can see that probably about 10% or actually about 13% of individuals had symptoms that lasted longer than 28 days. So median duration of 11 days, about one in 10 individuals were continuing to struggle with symptoms at 28 days. And there's been some debate about what is the definition of long COVID? Should it be individuals who've had symptoms for longer than a month? Would, might it be more appropriate for people who've had symptoms for longer than 12 weeks? The reality is what I would say to you and what I'm going to come back to a little bit later talking about the athletic population is that if you have symptoms of a condition for a month, it's an awful long time, especially if you're an athlete and you're wanting to train and do sport and you've got upcoming competitions, they're going to be seriously impacted. This is the, this is the data that's been set out by NICE, moving definitions from this four to four week early definitions that we used of long COVID out to this 12 week definition, which I've just mentioned. And the type of symptoms that you see in individuals who are struggling with more protracted or post-COVID or longer COVID symptoms are described again very nicely by these types of apps that monitor people. And you can see that whilst in the acute phase, breathlessness, uh, fatigue are very prominent symptoms. Sorry. Um, and acute cough is a very prominent symptom. In the post-COVID group, Yes, fatigue is still a very prominent issue. Yes, breathlessness is, but other symptoms such as cough and also things like a lack of appetite are far more, far less likely to be encountered. So there's some subtle but slight differences in the ongoing symptoms as they continue in people who have had COVID symptoms longer than 28 days. 
And we learn more about this from around the world. Here's a very nice paper from JAMA that really just re-emphasized that although COVID in the acute phase is predominated by cough and breathlessness and fever, especially for those who have more severe disease or require hospital care in the longer setting, there's a whole heap of constellation of different symptoms, but the key symptoms of fatigue and particularly shortness of breath. And of course, as you might imagine with me being a respiratory physician and Julie being a respiratory physiologist, we're going to really focus in on some of the issues relating to the chest and particularly, of course, shortness of breath uh, for the majority of this webinar. So, I've alluded to you that there's a big burden of disease in younger individuals, and I've talked about some of the figures that suggest that symptoms lasting longer than 28 days are a big problem. And of course, you would expect very naturally that young athletic individuals, right from elite level down to recreational athletic individuals, would encounter the same type of problems. And so it, so it um, transpired. And last year, we started to see individual and particularly professional elite athletes really struggling with symptoms and it making them very difficult for them to continue to train, particularly for the Olympic Games. And of course, you need to remember that the Olympic Games were still at some point last year scheduled to occur last year. And so it was a very unnerving time for lots of different people for different reasons. So I'm going to actually break at this point because I'm going to hand over to Guy, who I briefly introduced um, before. Um, and I'm going to ask Guy to turn on his camera and his microphone. And just he's going to share with you some of the experiences um, that he's had uh, with this condition um, and really share with you the lived experience as an athlete developing COVID. So it's over to you, Guy. I don't know if you can turn your video okay. on. I think That's I'm it, you're on. You're in. Can you, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. I can't see anything, so I hope you can, I hope everyone can see me. hope you can see me as well, James. Um, but yeah, firstly, thanks for, for inviting me on this, you know, the webinar tonight tonight um yeah i guess just to give a a, a wee bit of context um i picked up covid at the european championships in uh, in poland in march very early march and um i managed to escape it all year last year obviously as james has said tonight the olympics were postponed uh, last season and our sort of uh, you know whole sort of uh, race season was was delayed and we didn't know what was going on but we were able to get some sort of races uh last summer i managed to escape it all and then i went to our first sort of championship for the year in march of this year and a lot of our team um unfortunately came out with covid and i was obviously one of them uh, i had big aspirations of of winning a medal there but um i felt you know so drained throughout the semi-final when i was was competing out there and unfortunately got knocked out in the semi then when I came back home, I just felt horrendous. I was vomiting, fevering, all this sort of stuff. And um, then I obviously took my took my, my PCR test and the COVID tests. And the first few were actually negative. And then on the third or fourth day of arriving back home, I tested positive. So that obviously explained a few things. And then from from then on then on out, obviously I was in quarantine at the time with with coming back home. And I had about three or four weeks of really sort of struggling in training, tight chest, you know, breathlessness. My sleep was was absolutely abysmal. And that's actually really taken a good few months to really get on top of. And I felt like I had a cold, like in my sinuses and stuff for a good sort of three, four weeks. Um, now, obviously, the Olympics were going ahead. So I just kind of cracked on. Um, I didn't really take any time off training at all, which was a in hindsight is a, a, a big mistake but um before i knew it, i was out in america uh after about three or four weeks of, of having covid i had a training camp out there and then i had a full race plan um before coming back to europe and then to get ready for the olympic trials in the middle of june now when i was out there um that's when i really started to sense that was there was some issues and sort of post-covid issues which i was very reluctant to accept um i didn't want to accept that covid would affect my sort of ability to to train to train hard and, and obviously to um my recovery all that sort of stuff i was very um not ignorant just a bit of um dismissive with the whole thing and um you know it's uh i carried on with the whole camp i was in arizona for five six weeks and then training was actually going pretty well but every time i would do a session a hard sort of lactic endurance session um 
I would obviously, it would take two or three days to recover fully. And the ne- it was more so the next day that I was completely flawed. And obviously my heart rate was, 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 was far too high as well. And we tracked the sort of data on, on my watch and stuff every night for my, for my coaches and stuff. And um, my sort of rest and heart rate when I was sleeping was in the 60s, you know, sometimes high 60s. And usually it's 30s to 40s. So I knew there was issues there. Um, again, but I was just pretty, pretty reluctant to sort of, to sort of accept that. So finished the, finished the training camp, finished the races, which didn't really go too well. And then I came back home and I was trying to rule every single thing out. Um, the training, the, you know, uh, having to cut away all this sort of stuff. And again, reluctant to accept that COVID had any sort of, you know, sort of reason why I was, you know, performing badly. Um, once we sort of ironed everything out and then I went back out to Europe to race and the same thing was happening in the races. I was hitting five, 600 meters and my body was just, just shutting down. And then um, that's when I sort of accepted that was a, there was a problem. And that's when obviously our doctors got in touch with, with, with James and his team and, you know, really put, put everything together and, you know, had a shopping list of, of, of tests for me down at the clinic and, we finally got to the bottom of it, but um, yeah, I'm kind of here now. Obviously, I've missed out on Tokyo and um, pretty much my whole season, but I do feel in a much better place now. And the recovery, the last sort of four to six weeks, has been has been brilliant. And um, yeah, I feel in a, a much much better place now. Anyway, so yeah, the heart rate is, is back to normal, which is I think was a main thing for me. The sleep, and I'm actually starting to train. I'm not just hitting times that I would hit pre-COVID it's um times that I've never hit at all so I kind of feel like I've thankfully you know touch wood went to a, went to a different level now so it bodes well for the future but um yeah it's just the one thing that will lurk me for the next few years is, is, is not getting help sooner and um yeah I've got to wait three more years for the next Olympics so it's <laughs> it's it, that's heartbreaking in itself but I think just the whole you know severity of this is is uh is massive and i'm i'm glad i've i've, I've seeked help and and, and work with james and, and and julie and the whole team and them um, yeah they've you know got me back on track pun intended obviously so <laughs> so yeah i thank you um thank you very much indeed and you know especially thank you for your time this evening um giving us that description of what it was like for you i i it, we, what we might do is if, you, if you're kind enough we might um I finish off these talks and then if there's, if there's any q or a or session or, or people have got specific questions for you about some of the symptoms you had if you could if you were able to hang around that would be fabulous yeah yeah of course of course okay brilliant thank you very much indeed um listen i'm going to just go on with a few more slides and then i'll hand i'll hand over to julie as as we discussed for the uh, at, the, at the outset for the schedule so uh let me just get that back onto there so um, let me let me just turn a bit to what we know about um, COVID in athletic populations rather than some of the data I showed you before, which of course is more pertinent to the general population. And um, really, uh, as you might expect, the data is still emerging and it's emerging relatively rapidly. But I want to just focus on two studies really um, in the time that I've got. So one is a study that was done in Pretoria in South Africa. Um, called the uh, uh, AWARE study, which I was kind of remotely involved with, but it was a bit like the Zoe Tracker app where um, they set up an app which they said, look, if you're an athlete and you're getting symptoms of an infection, please could you fill this app in and tell us a bit about some of the symptoms you're getting and some of the problems you have. And I think it's still live now. So if you wanted to give that uh, to any athletes that you know, they're still collecting active data. And essentially from that um, data collection, they were able to divide a, a small cohort of, pop, pop, of, the, pop, of the people who filled in the data set um, with either confirmed um, or heavily suspected COVID and other forms of uh, respiratory tract infection. And you can see that the numbers are pretty small here, but this was early into the COVID scenario. And so it was one of the first data sets that was available. Um, and what they found, as you can see here, is a population of individuals who are filling in the app around the age of 30. About a third of them were professional athletes, um, and they were really 50-50% split for male and female. And they've been doing sport for quite a few years, obviously about 10 years here. Um, and what they showed, and I'm not going to share much of the data other than to say that those individuals who had had COVID infection 
as opposed to those who'd reported other forms of non-COVID related respiratory tract infection were far less likely to return to sport at a 40 day period. And if they looked at the type of symptoms that people or athletes were struggling with, they found that excess fatigue at the onset of their symptoms and the symptoms of chills, fever and headache particularly were particularly poor markers of uh, prolonged illness and that excessive fatigue was associated with a 70% lower chance of getting back to sport at a 40 day period after the onset of symptoms. So I turn to our study that we've just published within the last week in the BGSM, um, which is looking at a far more elite population and particularly um, the cohort of athletes who fall under the umbrella of the English Institute of Sport um, and some of the home nation sports institutes. Um, and, and effectively, these are athletes who are on a world class performance program. And by that, I mean, really, for the vast majority of them preparing for Olympic or Paralympic competition. And what we did was we looked at the data from the first wave in the UK, which was obviously around springtime last year. And we looked at the more recent up to autumn and into uh, January second wave. And you can see that um, the numbers for both these proportions were roughly similar, but in many cases in the first wave, we were unable to confirm the diagnosis of uh, COVID infection because of course, at that point, as many will recall, we weren't really um, doing PCR tests other than for those who were hospitalized and none of our 147 athletes were hospitalized. Um, and, that, and that's the full capture. So it wasn't that we excluded people who were hospitalized. And I just wanna share some pertinent um, data points really from this paper. So if you look at the duration of symptoms in this athletic, this very elite athletic population, what we found was this distribution, which showed that really the median duration of symptoms was about 10 days. And yet there was this tail of symptom individuals who had symptoms that lasted longer than a month. Um, that was about 14%. Now, if I take you back to the data I shared very early on in this, in this uh, webinar from the Zoe Tracker Act uh, for the UK population, and um, just place that graph over the top of this, you can see that actually they're pretty much overlapping. And you will recall that I shared with you the figure that over 28 days data was about 13.3% in the general population. So it seems to me that the elite athletic population in terms of the impact of symptoms was very similar to the natural population and the way that behaved, i.e. it wasn't that being an elite athlete suddenly made you bounce back any quicker. And I think that's helpful for helping to counsel athletes in that actually this illness is brand new to you and so your immune system is responding in the same way. You can argue that athletically trained individuals had a far lower prevalence of being hospitalized and certainly there is data that being physically fit seems to in some way protect you from being hospitalized or having severe disease certainly from a big korean data set that was published recently what about the impact on time loss to the sport and by time loss i mean being signed off as being fully available back to compete or to train vigorously as you were previously and we track this within our population. And so what you see here is that actually most athletes were getting back to their sport after two weeks or 17 days. But you can see this horrible tale here of one in four athletes, 27 percent, who still weren't signed off as being fully back and available to their sport at 28 days, which I'll argue is, is a horrible impact of a condition when at one month you're still not back fully training. And you heard the experience of Guy and how that horribly impacts the season. What we have the benefit of within this uh, EIS system is some historical data because we're very keen on tracking overall health data and the impact of illnesses and injuries to try and better understand them and their impact on sport. And so if you um, compare this with, say, for instance, the common cold and the data that we have for acute respiratory illness within the system, you can see a very different story where most athletes are back to sport fully within one or two days as you might expect from a common cold, and actually only 4% or one in 20 individuals are still struggling a month out. So a very different illness in terms of its protracted impact on sporting capability. We dug a bit deeper to see what might be a signal that suggests athletes who are gonna to struggle to get back to their, uh, to their sport and be fully available. And we characterized individuals by whether they had purely upper respiratory tract symptoms. So that might be, for instance, snotty nose, uh, change in the sense of smell or taste, um, or coughing and coughing only, so a dry, nasty cough, 
or lower, lower respiratory tract problems in which everyone included in this had to have some degree of breathlessness or chest discomfort, very like the symptoms that Guy really described. And what we found was that that was significantly different between the groups in terms of the duration and impact on availability. And it was actually far more likely that you were not going to be back at 28 days if you'd had a lower respiratory tract presentation than it was from an upper, suggesting that maybe those with an upper respiratory tract presentation could be counselled or could be considered to be returning back to their sports quicker than those with lower. Now, one of the things that obviously drives or concerns anyone who's um, athletic and has been um, uh, affected by COVID is the impact on the heart. And there's been a hell of a lot written about this and some very big studies now conducted. And I think last year we were in a situation where initially we were worried that maybe as high as one in four athletes might get inflammation of the heart. And that should curtail their ability to exercise until people have had things like a cardiac MRI. The data that's emerged, um, fortunately, over this year and certainly within the last few months is actually um, hugely more reassuring in that actually there's some very big data sets now. And the Americans have done some fantastic work looking at big data sets of athletes and doing very comprehensive cardiac screening with cardiac MRI, troponins, echocardiograms. It's not my area of expertise, but the bottom line is that the data is far more reassuring in that the overall figure of cardiac inflammation relating to uh, COVID-19 appears to be more in the region of 1% or less in some series. And even more reassuring is that this data from this very big data set suggested that this was really only apparent in those individuals who'd had a moderate systemic illness and had features of lower chest problems. So it's vanishingly unlikely that if you hadn't had breathlessness or chest discomfort or some issue like that, palpitations, that you were going to develop cardiac issues. So reassuring data, not entirely reassuring because it's still one in a hundred almost, but much more reassuring than we first thought. So at the ICH, we set up a uh, post-COVID uh, pathway to try and help athletic individuals and try and unpick the cardiac and the respiratory issues. And we still run this clinic. And of course, Julie, who you're going to hear from next, is a, is a key and integral part of that. And um, during our assessment, what we tend to do is look at different things like how the lung and the heart are functioning, of course, and we use uh, this test, the cardiopulmonary exercise test, to try and understand what happens during incremental exercise to heart rate response, but also to ventilatory, uh, ventilatory patterns. And we're interested in how the heart and lung all integrate in this system to allow athletes to exercise. I'm going to try and set the scene for Julie's talk now by just talking about one of the key finds we've uh, had within our service. Now, when we look at people who are struggling from any breathing issue, we're very interested in the pattern of their breathing. So here you see someone getting some ventilatory data collected. And very typically, people breathe in and breathe out in this sort of sinusoidal wave pattern, which is nice and rhythmic. But we've seen an awful lot of athletes who have been struggling with their breathing and have a very irregular, erratic pattern and using the wrong parts of their chest or the, le or the, le or the parts of the, uh, the thorax that are less efficient in terms of generating good ventilation. And so we see this with this test where you see here against time during the exercise test, these very erratic tidal volumes. And that makes the breathing inefficient. So when the ventilation is higher for the clearance of waste gases. And it brings up this diagnosis of dysfunctional breathing and nicely sets the scene in a second for Julie to talk about how we've been able to tackle this and help athletes. So I'm going to conclude there by just saying, look, you know, long or post COVID or whatever you'd like to use as a correct terminology at 28 days, I think is a relevant time point and the athletes is a real issue. In elite athletes, the study I've just shown you, we found that uh, approximately a quarter were not back at one month. And the upper respiratory localization of symptoms may be predictive and helpful in terms of predicting a more rapid return to sport. Fortunately, COVID-19 related serious cardiac issues appear to be rare or more rare than we thought, although still do occur and need to be considered. Um, of course, we need to do much more to understand the delayed return to play. So it's one thing to say, a quarter aren't back at a month is another thing to ask the question of why and what can be done precisely to try and help them. But hopefully Julie's going to uh, share her thoughts with you now. So I'm going to stop there. Um, if anyone wants to contact me, there's the details, but we will catch up in the Q&A. So let me mute myself and unshare. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, good evening, everybody, and um, let me just have a go 
at sharing my screen and getting up my presentation too so we can get started. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to see my... Okay, we all good? So yeah, so thank you ever so much for inviting us uh, this evening to talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hull, for the introduction. And also thank you, Guy. Really, really um, great to hear your experience because I think it just informs us so much. And I'm keen as a respiratory physiotherapist to um, explain to you some of the things that I did with Guy and, and the athletes in terms of helping uh, recover from COVID and really highlighting the importance of getting the breathing right to aid that recovery. So it's very much going to be a, a sort of um, a, a, a night, a interventions that you can do as a therapist to help speed up the recovery. So let's get on. Let's start by taking a breath, but just make sure it's a good one. And that is absolutely essential. OK, so my question to you is, do you know what a good breath looks like? And are you actually breathing well now? Hopefully you're all sitting relaxed. It's uh, the evening, possibly not for everyone if you're in other parts of the uh, world. But, you know, hopefully you're nice and relaxed and you're breathing well. We're going to find out because I'm going to give you an opportunity to actually look at your breathing. Really important to understand what good breathing looks like. And then I think probably to get started, but let's look at what, you know, how poor breathing might hinder recovery and, and, and getting back into training. And some of the things that Guy said in terms of, you know, not being able to perform at his best. So very simply, what happens to uh, your breathing with COVID? Well, we know as the virus invades the body, absolutely normal response for your sympathetic nervous system to become activated. And I've got my next slide is going to talk about the autonomic nervous system and a little reminder, but I know um, you guys will be aware of your sympathetic nervous system. We all feel it's a normal, normal part of your body that responds to danger, um, gets your body, uh, your breathing fast or your heart rate increases. As I say, would want that to happen and it's important for your body to be able to fight the virus. The problem we've got is that often this overactive sympathetic nervous system can continue on, continue regardless of whether the, the virus um, is still in your body, it, it's continually activated. And remind of your autonomic nervous system, your autonomic nervous system is like a balancing act, isn't it? So when your sympathetic nervous system is activated, your parasympathetic nervous system is diminished and your parasympathetic is your rest and digest. It's the repair, the restoring, it's the recovery. And what I see um, in people that are suffering with on ongoing symptoms of COVID, including athletes, is this inability to get their parasympathetic nervous system back in play. And this predominant sympathetic nervous system is continually activated for all sorts of reasons. And it's important to pull that apart. And so I had, um, oh no, this slide is just explaining about what that does to the, the breathing. So when the sympathetic nervous system is dominant, we know that that increases the breathing pattern. But the problem is, is the breathing pattern that gets um, stimulated is a very inefficient. It's okay at the time to get you through the virus, but it's not, it's very much upper chest. It um, takes up way too much energy. So it's not sustainable. That causes muscle tension. We get sleep problems. And as you can imagine, before you know it, this, this snowballs out of control and, and the person is, ex, is experienced really nasty symptoms, which then causes lots of worry, lots of stress, and, and the, the cycle continues. But this slide next, I want to show you, we did some work, collaboration with a variety of people, specifically um, with Optima Life. And what we did, I'll explain what this graph is. This graph is just setting the scene. OK, we were measuring the autonomic nervous system. This is in, in one person and this is a, a, almost a day. OK, what you'd expect to see in a day is during the daytime, your red sympathetic nervous system is activated. And at nighttime, your parasympathetic nervous system is predominant, okay? And the two should be a nice balance. And that what that does is give the person's body a chance to recover and be able to get up the next day and carry on with exercising, your, your everyday activities or, you know, training. Look at that lovely heart rate variability. Remember the higher the heart rate variability, the more recovered you are. It gives us an indication of whether the person's ready to then exercise. That's, the, that's what we're looking for here, okay? Look at this. This is someone eight months. So we're not, you know, we're talking a long time after COVID. And we saw this time and time again where 
predominant sympathetic nervous system. Okay, this is not nice. this is so going all through the night. So the person did actually go to sleep. They said they slept for eight hours. They weren't they weren't traipsing around. They were asleep. They, you know, but they were getting very poor quality sleep. And look at that heart rate variability. It's eleven. It's too low. The person's not been able to recover. So it's absolutely essential that we are can intervene and help the person to get their parasympathetic nervous system back in action and get that balance back. And so what I often see, and I just thought this is a nice, really visual sort of view of what the sort of type of breathing patterns that I see, because we know that that breathing pattern, that post-COVID breathing pattern, where you see the shoulders going up and down, that green dome there is the diaphragm not getting contracted, inefficient, causes all sorts of problems, and it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system compared to that more efficient breathing where you've got the one on the side there where the diaphragm's contracting nicely. A little bit on the far side for me, but we'll it, it still gives you the idea and we know and this is a paper that we can put into the chat and Oliver is going to put it in if, if anyone is interested looking at the importance and the the relevance and the impact of what you can do with slowing your breathing down and how we know that there is this um, a direct effect on parasympathetic nervous system so your autonomic nervous system your cardiovascular um, system can be um, influenced by your breathing and although breathing is automatic we can override it for short periods of time and we can slow it down so we have got tools to be able to help our patients really get that parasympathetic nervous system back on so just coming back to breathing in terms of that shoulder upper chest breathing pattern that we see a lot with long covid um, patients both um, like, like we said, you know, the, even those with the milder forms of the disease uh, and no matter what their activity levels were like pre-COVID. So often it's that chest discomfort where you can imagine the ribs don't really don't like continual moving. The muscles don't like continually moving. They are not designed the breathlessness because of the inefficient breathing pattern and the fatigue symptoms. You can imagine wasting too much energy because the parasympathetic nervous system is not able to do what it needs to do. So you're not able to recover between training sessions. And then also we've got to be careful as well. You know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, talking about taking deep breaths we're a bit obsessed with taking big deep breaths and when I see people we see people doing big excessive sighs and you know what it leads to often this chronic hyperventilation and that can really mess up the homeostasis within the body become very sensitive to carbon dioxide levels and you can see when someone breathes too much that uh, slide there shows the blood flow to the brain how it's dramatically reduced. I think people think if they breathe more, they're going to get more oxygen, when in actual fact, it causes vasoconstriction. So we've got to be really careful with this. So I said we were going to look at breathing. It's only going to take a minute, but I think it's really important for you to do this, to have a look yourself. So I'm going to get a timer on in a second. I'll tell you when I press the timer. But these are things I want you to think about. First of all, when you're sitting relaxed, can you keep your mouth closed? OK, you breathe through your nose. Have a little feel, as I show in the uh, photo there, is it, you know, hand over the sort of belly button where the diaphragm is on the chest and see what's moving. Count how many breaths you can take and think about whether, or listen to hear what we can hear yourself breathing. And also, is it smooth? Is it erratic? Is there different, different size breaths, big ones, little ones? Is there pauses in between? It's quite a lot to look at. Okay, so let's just give it a go. So I'm gonna just give you a minute. I'm gonna do mine too for the minute. So when you're ready, off you go. and stop okay so let's see how you did so 
let's look let's pull apart breathing and hopefully you can think about what you what you how you got on there so hopefully you're all able to keep your mouth closed that's absolutely essential i know that um you know the majority of the time we should be breathing through our nose i know that we don't necessarily do this often when we talk we can we do open our mouths but when we're running around when we're training we open our mouths i get that but when you are sat still resting your nose your nose warms the air cleans the air moistens the air it really encourages good diaphragm and it's absolutely essential for you to keep control of the flow and the volume of air so it's really important for efficient breathing okay so that's the first thing that hopefully you're all doing second thing is will you get in did you have a nice relaxed upper chest absolutely essential to get good efficient breathing so the diaphragm's contracting nicely making the tummy rise up come down again hopefully it was quiet often when i can hear people breathing it just shows the volume is possibly a little bit too big or there might be a little bit of over contraction of the tummy muscles as you as the person's breathing out just forcing it you tend to see that with fast breathing rates so how did you get on with the number of breaths you took hopefully uh you, your guidance is between eight to twelve breaths but i know that there'll be probably be some of you that will possibly breathe in faster volumes are actually really quite small 500 i know it's roughly but you know really quite small volumes i think we sort of expect ourselves to be breathing more don't we but really just a slight you know really just a puff up at the tummy and down again that kind of gives us the nice amount of air coming through our lungs now we breathe what twenty five thousand times a day so you can imagine it doesn't take much to get this wrong and it can go wrong very subtly and it's absolutely essential that we are teaching our patients our athletes to to breathe properly at rest okay so if you want to know more about this there's a, a website and you can uh, there's me there um, a few years ago now how to assess your own breathing pattern so you can ping that to people we'll put the um the uh, link into the chat there but really nice to visualize and look and see how breathing changes with different positions so recommend having a look at that website and you know what we this is often what i'm telling the athletes to do is actually rein it in slow it down breathe down into the tummy really nice practice low slow tummy breathing and that can actually help to get that balance back in the parasympathetic nervous system and i often talk to athletes about relaxation and i think sometimes people get a bit confused between relaxation and downtime so downtime isn't really relaxing and relaxing is fundamental i know as therapists we're really keen to talk about exercise lots of chat about when can we get back exercising and the person's itching to get back exercise and they get that but if they're not resting they're not recovering they're not going to be able to return to exercise so you've got to be able to help people understand this it's educational and as guy said about sleep you know you're not going to sleep properly if you can't get your, your body nice and relaxed and this is really challenging post covid um, you know, with the, not, not just the virus, but the whole stress of, of, you know, what we've had to live through for the last sort of 18 months. So really important. You've got to find your, the relaxation that works for you. And so when I say to people, how do you relax? They're like, well, you know, I, I go on my Xbox or I watch Netflix. I'm like, that's not relaxing. Okay. We're talking about good physiological relaxation. So really important as therapists that we promote this. And I think that just touching um, on, um, you know, the fatigue as being a really significant symptom. And again, I think we sort of think about fatigue coming with our energy systems in terms of how much physical activity we do. But just as a reminder that your energy system in your body is drained by lots of different ways. And so often when I'm chatting with athletes, I am talking about the, looking at them holistically, you know, in terms of understanding, even just social activities can be draining that emotional side of, um, um, of the energy system can be extremely draining you imagine the stress that these athletes go through in terms of not being able to perform and also the cognitive and i think it's just also just to touch on um you know when when athletes or, or people with long covid are thinking about to returning to exercise it's important to you know see how your body responds i think you've got to be able to have some stability um in everyday life and then you see how your body responds and we know that sometimes it can take 24 i think guy said didn't it, it wasn't till the next day can take up to 72 hours really important that we put things in place to enable people to rest rather than the thing that i see a lot is they try they want to do it they get they do too much they come crashing back down again 
and then they wait and then they think oh my gosh I feel better today go again doesn't work boom bust cycle we have to stabilize you and so this is a bit of an idea of someone who we measured for three days who wasn't breathing well wasn't getting parasympathetic nervous system um, and so you can see there that um, that line that um, goes from uh, the site, you know, the starting level to three days later, their body's resources were going down. This person's not getting better compared to um, intervening for about six weeks of good breathing with training, good relaxation, no exercise at this stage, but improving the parasympathetic nervous system. And look, we're starting to see body resources coming back up again. So this is gonna be different for different people, but you can imagine in terms of how long and duration you've got to do this for, but you can, um, it's really important that we're looking at body's resources improving. This is essential for athletes in terms of recovery between sessions. So obviously in the athlete, we've got to think about not just breathing at rest, but we've got to think about breathing when they move around, when they exercise, when they're training as well. One of the two things that I see um, is, well, it's really important that we look at the rib cage and how it moves. So we know that as we start to move around, our rib cage you know, needs to open up, our, our volumes increase. And so we, we want our rib cage to respond to that. But we often see two things. One is this subcostal angle at the Bradcliffe team down in the Southern Hemisphere in New Zealand, um, I'm big on and, and worked with them where they're basically the rib cage becomes hyperinflated. Okay. So it gets stuck out into this position. I see this a lot with athletes that have got uh, doing uh, sports with a lot of volume of, of air coming through their lungs. Up here, you can imagine what's happened is the diaphragm's in a semi-contracted position. And so they have to recruit upper respiratory chest muscles and that's going to lead to all sorts of problems or the opposite occurs where the, that angle is really tight upper abdominals are very tight rib cage can't move and then again can't open up diaphragm is restricted and again the upper respiratory muscles are are um, activated this go this leads into all sorts of problems and what we think possibly happens and again I think I touched on this what I think my, what does happen with athletes is you know they're still performing but they just can't sustain the pace and when the when the diaphragm's not in its optimal position to contract it's going to fatigue and basically what we think possibly is this reflex sends messages up to the brain to cause the lower limb vasoconstriction. constriction but basically the diaphragm trumps the lower limb muscles and gets the blood and that obviously really causes lower limb fatigue pace drops off perceived exertion goes up so absolutely essential we get the breathing right even with um you know even with looking at symptoms around fatigue too they are related so people often say to me how do you recognize breathing you know when someone's um running or doing their sports it's quite challenging because the person is breathing very fast and i would say to you two things listen listen to their breathing you will hear that inspiratory gasp obviously watch as well watch the shoulders um, and you will find that the a very fast upper chest and you might even start hearing some tightening in the throat as everything is just starting to struggle. So really important that we enable that lower rib cage to be able to move again. Really important that we are able to make sure that the person is exhaling properly, especially if they're hyperinflated. Really, when the rate gets very fast, often people don't give enough time to exhale. So again, looking at that more close, it's really individual. Um, but also remember about breathing well at rest before the exercise, even thinking about exercise, someone's breathing is going to get faster. So we've really got to make sure people breathe well before they exercise, when they exercise and after they've exercised to really being able to help those symptoms of um, breathlessness. Just want to mention a few things around what other thing, tools you can use facilitating rib cage movement. Uh, so muscle and spiritual trainers have, have gained quite a lot of traction long COVID and I'm a, I'm a big fan of them. Um, really more specifically around improving biomechanics uh, rather than really increasing the load. I think it's important to get that diaphragm moving well, but I would just say be careful with athletes that have got exercise induced lumen glue obstruction because it can really create quite a lot of tightness here, um, um, which is not something obviously uh, making that worse. So be careful with that. Make sure we get nice lower rib cage movements. And I've had the opportunity to talk with the uh, rehab guru guys as well. So just looking at exercise platforms and integrating breathing 
um, within these platforms, which is really exciting. But we know that the diaphragm is a uh, stabilizing muscle as well as of respiratory. So it has a dual role and as exercise increases, it becomes quite challenging. So making sure that, you know, in different positions, you're getting the diaphragm working well. And I know that, um, you know, this is not a new thing with yoga, with Pilates, we've done this a lot. But the one thing you've got to be careful of when you're doing this is just be careful not to do too much. Remember those that are possibly suffering with hyperventilation, chronic hyperventilation, just make sure you don't deplete the CO2 levels while you're doing it. So be careful how many you do. Okay, last few slides. Uh, I cannot not, I can't not talk about breathing and talk about the emotional side of breathing because our breathing changes when, depending on how we're feeling, doesn't it? We've all experienced this, whether you're excited, uh, you know, nervous, upset, scared, this will make your breathing pattern change. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. If you're not familiar with um, Steve Peters' work, uh, the Chimp Paradox, I really recommend it. It's a really nice way of helping someone understand how their brain works and potentially how you can control it more. Because what he talks about is your emotional side to your brain. He splits it up into different uh, parts of uh, your brain, your computer and your human brain and bits of the brain that works off uh, rational thoughts. But your chimp, your chimp basically catastrophizes. It jumps to conclusions. We've all experienced this at some point. So really good at being able to keep control of your chimp is really important. So for me, what that's doing is keep control of your chimp. You can keep control of your breathing too. And that's absolutely essential uh, when it comes to recovering from covid so just to summarize uh, my points today, which I think hopefully I've got across is that good, efficient breathing is absolutely essential for recovery from COVID, no matter what level of sporting person that is or fitness levels, trying to get back to pre-COVID levels, absolutely essential. Really important that as therapists that we promote good balance within the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, use the tools teach your, teach your athletes how to promote good sleep habits, teach them experiment with relaxation teach them how to slow their breathing down how to get good efficient breathing um and and really be careful with that whole you know with the exercise if it hasn't worked you've got to rein it in avoid that boom bust cycle that often people get stuck in good okay so uh anyone obviously needs any help please do refer any athletes or patients up to us to look at their breathing and I'll just stop sharing there now, hopefully. There we go. Thanks, Julie. So <clears throat> I think we're going to move into the Q&A. And there are lots of questions from everybody. The one thing that I would say is we've been getting lots of comments and questions in the chat, uh, which is great. But if you do have questions that you'd really like to see answered, could you please post them in the Q&A? I think I've messaged a few of you directly, um, but there, <laughs> there are quite a large number now. So um We'll dive straight in. The, the top two or three are addressed mainly at Guy, but I think James and Julie might might like to speak to them as well. Um, the the me most popular question is around the tests and interventions um, that you underwent, Guy, because I know you had quite a lot of testing done at the start. Um, I don't know if you maybe want to speak to your experience of that, and James, you can come in maybe. Um, let us know the, the screening tests and battery tests that I went through. J James, I think this is probably more one for you <laughs> to talk about all the tests. And there were so many tests and got these weird names and stuff that I can barely even remember. So, <laughs> James, I think if you want to talk about that, um, yeah, just to kind of go through a sort of everything, I guess, from start to finish. But what I can say it was a full a full day of, of testing and, and with, with various professors and doctors and um, to really get to the bottom of things. So, um, yeah, thankfully we did very quickly. So, yeah, that's, that's all for the whole team. You know it's serious when you end up seeing a professor. Um, or, maybe, <laughs> or maybe not. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, I suppose the, 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 the summary is that the testing serves two purposes, really. One, of course, to reassure people that there isn't something that's pathologically wrong. And so, you know, from my perspective, for, for anyone who's breathless, the key things that I really think about are obviously, one, is there any cardiac involvement? Um, because, as I said, it's reassuring to see a low prevalence overall. But it isn't reassuring if you're that one athlete in 100 who's got it. So you want to be reassured. And I mean, I can, I can talk more about that, but 
that, that, that's one of the key elements. The other elements are trying to ensure that the lung hasn't suffered any longer term consequences. And very thankfully, we're seeing incredibly low um, uh, prevalent signals of longer term fibrotic changes in young individuals. So it, it's less of a concern, but we do a test called ga a gas exchange, which looks at how the lung takes up oxygen. And the third thing that I really focus in on is how the heart rate responds and whether there is changes in oxygen um, and particularly whether there could be a signal of some baby uh, or, or small blood clots that have got to the uh, lung blood vessels. So that's the sort of gist of things. You know, for some athletes that is slightly more nuanced because there's, there's a history of asthma, then, you know, we want to get the asthma treatment right and make sure that, that those, uh, those aspects are well controlled. So it, it, it's slightly different, but that's the sort of the gist of the type of test that Guy would have undergone. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the, my questions are moving around as people uh, vote for them, so we'll go with Sanchez's question next, which is top. Um, are the protocols for returning to sport following COVID and long COVID the same for all types of athletes, i.e. endurance athletes versus um, kind of shorter distance speed and power athletes? Do you want me to take, on? To take that one on? Julie? Yeah. Do you want me to tell that? Yeah, okay. I mean, so, so the, return to, the return to play has been really interesting. And it, the, the short answer is, um, yeah, I mean, essentially an athlete is an athlete at the moment and we don't have enough data to show that endurance athletes are any different from uh, other types of athletes. Um, the original 10-day rule where we said, look, you know, you should have 10 days out um, and you should be, um, I think it was five or seven days free from symptoms before you return to sport, was basically um, something we wrote in an editorial in the Lancet series um, early last year. And the basis for that recommendation, contrary to what people think about that, was that really there was data emerging from China that suggested that this was following a biphasic course. So you get an infection with the um, initial infection, but the time you get your most uh, or your most vulnerable period where you might develop a pneumonitis is at day seven. So our recommendation to stop people exercising hard in the day zero to 10 period was with the supposition that maybe that was a time when your immune system was trying to fight a novel um, bug and you were a bit more vulnerable and perhaps you could be at increased risk of developing cardiac or damage or, or pneumonitis at that point. So that was sort of how it shaped our return to play. And of course, you know, I'm, ho I'm hopeful that the information that I've just shared and published will actually speed the return to play in individuals who've got simply symptoms in their upper respiratory tract. It might be as short as five days, but no difference between endurance and power athletes that we, we know and certainly nothing we saw in our study. Brilliant. Um, another question directed at Guy. Um, so... Rebecca has a patient who's currently struggling with insomnia, difficulty sleeping as part of long COVID symptoms. Um, so firstly, Guy, was that something you experienced? And if so, any tips or advice um, that helped with your sleep as part of your recovery? And I guess, Julie, as well, you, you may want to speak to that, that point. Yeah, I think my personal experience is like, as years gone, I only really, sorry, the last sort of 18 months, I really got on top of like my sleep hygiene. Um, I brought in a new S&C coach the last year and he's really uh, nailed things in terms of, um, you know, uh, blue lens blockers, getting off the your phone screens, iPad screens and stuff at a certain time of the night, uh, starting to wind down almost an hour or two before getting into bed, uh, using different different lights and stuff in, in the evening. Um and very similar to that. But when I did have COVID, that was one of the main things that really, um, that I really struggled with. And <clears throat> I went from having eight, nine hours sleep a night to four or five. And this was when I was in peak, peak training as well. This was probably four or five weeks after, after COVID when I was on a uh, training camp in, in America and my sleep was just, it was, it was diabolical and that lasted for a long time. And I think eventually when, I couldn't really break that cycle. You, you stress yourself out. <laughs> like, you know, you, um, you, you, you keep yourself up at night and, and, and it gets worse. You just, you do get into this sort of, um, this sort of deeper hole, so to speak. So I don't know if that was to do with, um, the sort of, I don't know, the lack of option I was, that was going around my body and stuff before I got things sorted with, with, with James and Julian and stuff like that. But definitely once I, after I got help and once I got back on top of, my sleep hygiene and, and coming off the phone screens and, and really starting to wind down at night. Um, 
with you know the help doing my rehab and stuff with the team um i really managed to get back off back on top of my you know the sort of the sort of sleep hygiene and as i said my heart rate went from it was in, in the 60s you know sometimes high 60s you know when i was sleeping to now it's well last night was was 35 throughout the night and that's really sort of you know between 35 and 40 most nights now so i'm that to me i know i'm kind of back to where I am and back to where I need to be and I know my body's recovering properly um it has taken some time um but yeah I guess just the the, the blue lens blockers the you know winding down at night the coming off the phone screens and stuff as much as possible and I guess Julie will talk about the various sort of relaxation methods and, and exercise as well to really to get on top of that yeah yeah definitely it's those those we know that it's- habits that, we, that really can um, develop over a period of time so you know like I say is making sure you go to bed at the same time every night get up at the same time every morning you know creating some routine where your body starts to learn again that it's time to go to sleep but obviously breathing slowing breathing relaxation calming down down the sympathetic nervous system so all the techniques that we talked about in the presentation as well Great stuff. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're going to get through a couple more questions, I think, um, but we are already slightly over. Um, there's, there's some popular ones here. Hey, sorry, Guy, did you want to come in? No, 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 sorry. Oh, it's just, it flicked on, that's all. Um, so Darren Brown's asking, and Darren, thank you. Uh, you linked in the chat as well to the World Physiotherapy Briefing Paper on long COVID physio. So there is the resource in there in the chat from Darren, if anyone wants to check that out. Um, Darren's asking if, um, you've got any data on cardiopulmonary exercise testing um, with your athletes? And kind of, are you doing that regularly and monitoring symptoms, or is that a, is that a test that you're using? And what's the data looking like? So I, so I take that. I mean, the, so we, we we haven't reported our data set yet. Um, there's actually loads of data coming out in more general non-athletic populations talking about CPET now. So. Um, some very recent data, I think, from Italy or France uh, in the last week, which is really interesting, which uh, seems to align with what we've been finding in that actually the, probably one of the mo- most common findings is of irregularities in breathing control. Um, and I know I've reviewed some other papers which are going to emerge and show similar, similar findings. I mean, from our point of view, it, it serves for me the purpose to be able to ensure that gas exchange is normal um, and that it's efficient and also so and, and the, the way the cardiac system is responding is is appropriate i.e there isn't sudden accelerations in heart rate or rhythm disturbances so it's reassuring but it also then identifies the breathing pattern irregularities which rule in the importance of uh, getting getting duly involved to help and, and and we can share that data with the athlete to show them we're not we're not doing repeated sequence because you know for many of the parameters that you might measure with this they're as much affected by training status as other things so it's, it's incredibly complicated to try and follow that brilliant i'm going to take one last question from tom <clears throat> thank you tom you're the top for ages so i will take it and it's a great question Tom says he currently works in elite sport uh, and on return post-COVID, the players were undergoing ECGs prior to uh, being reintroduced into training, which is analysed by the cardiologists, but they only have that if they've been symptomatic. Uh, what would be, what would your opinion be on all athletes who've tested positive having ECG uh, prior to resumption training, regardless of symptoms? So I guess James probably aimed, aimed at you. I mean, yeah, I'm not a cardiologist, but chatting to Sanjay Sharma, who some of you will know on the call, many of you will know, he's a, he's a very eminent sports cardiologist. His feeling is that, um, you know, asymptomatic athletes don't need an ECG if they've been entirely asymptomatic and detected um, in that fashion. Um, and so I, I think actually the emerging data, um, big data sets from the States certainly t- are tending to support that really, that I don't think it's, it's, it's indicated in that context. But as I said, with the caveat that I'm not a cardiologist and so, you know, you might, you might want to take a view for your team or your, your, your cohort of athletes on that. Brilliant. Um, I think we should, we should probably wrap up the session guys, given the, given the time and um, we're a little bit over. What I would say is that I, I'll share links to all the resources that we've discussed and, and brought up in tonight's session in the post webinar email. Um, and I'm, I'm sure our speakers have to confirm now for me if you'd be happy for me to share information on where you can look up your work and, and reach out to maybe on social media or by email. And 
for those of you who we haven't been able to answer the questions, please do feel free to send them through, get in touch with us, and, and you know, we will get round to that. Of course, massive thank you uh, to you, James, Julie, Helen, Fraser for organising, and especially to you, Doug, for giving up your time this evening. Um, Thanks, Alan. Really extremely valuable and, and important really added to the session and I think the expertise that we've had from everybody has been has been really excellent I'm going to have to go back and watch this again because I was too busy hosting and, and messaging in the chat to pay attention to it all but um, yeah I think it's been a brilliant session um, just a quick reminder for everyone on a, on a housekeeping front and um, you'll get the email from tomorrow so please be patient um, We'll share all the resources with you. And if you could take two minutes to complete the survey when you do leave the session, we would really, really appreciate it. Um, when I end this, it's going to kick us all out, all at the same time. It's quite abrupt. Um, so I will say thank you once again. Uh, enjoy your evening. And I will speak to you all soon. Cheers.